In these days of information overload, it's often hard to sift through it all to get the answers you need. And not only that, the answers are often hidden behind mountains of endless talking, taking what feels like forever to get to the point. Enter the Garden Quickie. Hyper-focused two-minute videos covering singular topics, straightforward, without all the fluff. Indulge with me for a moment as we hit the half-century mark of episodes with the Garden Quickie. And done. Here's episodes 41 to 50. Enjoy. Successfully growing your favorite crops right from the beginning all the way up until the harvest means many things have correctly fallen into place. And while some aspects of gardening may be beyond our control, learning from and not repeating mistakes is not. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms, and welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we try to eliminate all the mistakes. And today's episode is just that, avoiding the most common gardening mistakes. For this video, I've picked out three of the big ones. If you're just starting out on your garden journey and you want an easier path to food self-sufficiency, learning from the mistakes of others is a great way to get a head start. As always, time's short, so let's dive right in. Mistake number one to avoid before you even get started with your garden is improper bed size. In the case of raised beds, bigger isn't always better. Both in height and square area. The taller you go with raised beds, the higher the cost of soil to fill it with that you're going to face, at least initially. And for area, going too big means you're going to have a tough time reaching the middle. Harvesting and weeding becomes a chore. My rule of thumb for building new garden beds is, if you have access to all sides, four feet is a good starting width. If not, stick to two feet wide and save your back. The second biggest mistake to avoid is improper watering both in quantity and frequency. New gardeners will frequently water their crops, often daily. In the ground or in pots, this can have a real negative effect on your plants. Watering too frequently and not enough will cause your plants to have shallow root systems and not dive deep into the soil. They're not gonna be able to do their job and anchor the plant properly, and they won't be able to withstand drought or warmer temperatures nearly as well. Water deeply and thoroughly, but less often and your plants will respond much better. And try to water in the morning. It gives your plant the best chance to actively grow during the daylight hours, and it's the optimal time to water for your crops. And the third mistake to avoid is improper spacing. When you first plant out a garden area, there may be huge gaps between the plants. New growers wanting to be as efficient as possible are gonna feel the impulse to fill in those empty spaces, not realizing that plants grow up fast and they also grow out fast. The spacing requirements for each crop is known and documented. Don't try to reinvent the wheel for stuff that's already been figured out. Gardening can be frustrating at times when things don't go our way, but having the ability to learn from others' mistakes and prevent them before they even happen should help you become a better grower. Know what else should help all of us become better growers? Hopefully the next episode of The Garden Quickie. Potatoes are a garden and dietary staple. Of all the crops I grow, fresh baby potatoes right out of the garden has to be one of the most rewarding. And as a bonus, these little beauties produce more potato plants right on the surface of their skin. But once they do sprout, what's next? Well, we have two options. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we cover all the latest gardening topics. And today is all about the next steps for your sprouted potatoes. Contrary to popular belief, sprouting your potatoes, also known as chitting, can happen in the dark or the light. Too dark, however, and you may end up with giant light seeking stalks that are impossible to deal with. I've previously covered chitting and making your own seed potatoes before, right here, but let's go over the process again real quick to bring you up to speed. Sprouting your own potatoes at home to obtain new plants takes about two to three weeks. Keep the potatoes above freezing. I find that 60 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit is ideal and try to keep them out of really warm direct sunlight. Oddly enough, the potatoes we eat are not actually part of the root system of the potato plant. In fact, 
They're modified stems. And on the surface of those stems, you'll see little dots. We call those eyes. That's where the new potato plants arise from. And so if you've set your potatoes aside in the right conditions, they'll sprout brand new little tiny potato plants right off the surface of their skin. Okay, easy enough. They've sprouted. Now what? Sprouted potatoes can be planted right away out in your garden if your spring frost has passed. If it's still winter outside, however, then we gotta pot them up indoors, like we're gonna do today. A small four inch pot should be enough for each sprout. Notice how I said each sprout. Although each potato will have many sprouts on their surface, they don't all get planted together. Each one is an individual new plant and it should be grown separately. I cut each sprout off, leaving about half an inch of potato still attached. This is gonna help anchor the plant. Fill up your potter container with regular organic potting mix and simply press the potato cutting down to secure the planting. Easy stuff. Water from below and keep at room temperature with as much light as you can give them. Within a couple of weeks, the plants will have grown an astonishing amount, ready for the garden as soon as spring hits. Know what else is going to be ready? Hopefully you and me in the next episode of The Garden Quickie. I'm all for making life easier, especially when it comes to gardening. With the yearly ritual of indoor seed starting almost upon us, we're all looking for an edge to work smarter, not necessarily harder. I've already done a video on direct seeding versus starter transplants right here, but as many of you are well aware, there's a third option to starting your crops. And that's winter seeding. And it makes sense because it follows the natural life cycle that some seeds experience over the course of winter, but it's not without its drawbacks. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we investigate all the different ways to garden. And today we're talking about winter sowing. Actually, we're looking at reasons not to winter sow. There's a few of them, but today I got three. Time's short as always, so let's get into it. First off, winter sowing has quite a few benefits, and it can actually be effective. Some seeds need the cold stratification to properly germinate, and seeds germinated outdoors can skip that laborsome hardening off process that indoor transplants have to go through. It saves space indoors, and fungal diseases like dampening off are virtually eliminated. On top of all that, using containers like the milk jug method can actually protect shallow sown seeds from birds and other seed stealers. The cold seeding method works well for the plants that need the natural chill of winter, but it's not always rosy in the land of winter sowing. One drawback to this method is unpredictability, especially now with extreme climate events becoming more common than ever. One day it can feel just like spring, and the next, it's a snowstorm and a frigid cold, just to remind you that winter isn't even half over yet. If your seeds have received enough clues to be stratified, and then sprout because of a warm spell, one heavy chill back to normal, and they could be toast. That's fine for natural alpine plants that can totally recover. Not so fine for a fruit crop that you're relying on. Another drawback to winter sowing are difficulties with long growing crops. And not even necessarily your warm crops like tomatoes and peppers. Look at plants like onions and leeks. Those are two plants that definitely benefit from a head start indoors. Trying to winter sow those guys while resulting in hardy strong plants could also result in a disappointing crop in terms of actual stem and bulb size. And lastly, even if you do get a successful batch of winter sown seeds, that crop can still be well behind the ones you have growing indoors, and you'll be giving up that valuable head start. Like anything, there's pros and cons, and winter sowing is no different. Direct winter seeding is not some new revelation. Some crops are definitely going to benefit from it, and some won't. One benefit we can all agree on, however, is the next episode of The Garden Quickie. Seed viability tests. The fastest, most effective way to determine whether or not your seeds are viable and are in fact gonna be able to germinate. Saving you both time and money. Brilliant. But once you get your answer, tossing aside those seeds like yesterday's newspaper doesn't really add to those savings. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. 
Welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we tackle all the gardening questions. And today's episode is all about planting those pre-sprouted seeds. Being thrifty and not wasteful is great, no doubt. But planting pre-sprouted seeds isn't without its drawbacks. Here's a few reasons not to plant pre-sprouted seeds. Okay, we've got that out of the way. And we've made sure that we have the correct plant types and it's the right time of year to be sprouting our seeds anyways. How do we do this? Planting pre-sprouted seeds is a bit trickier and more nuanced than simply planting dormant ones. Let me explain. The pre-sprouted seeds from our viability test have been conditioned, all of their very short life so far, to survive in a very specific environment. Basically, one that is hyper-optimal for germination. An environment that was warm, 100% humid, highly oxygenated, and very stable. To have the best chance at moving these seeds to a traditional soil setup, i.e. planting them, you have to minimize any of the changes in those parameters. It's not too hard, but it really will dictate your success. So, always pre-soak your soil, and if you're bringing it in from outside, make sure to let it sit and get to the same temperature that your seeds are at. Gently pull the seeds apart, both from themselves and the tissue paper, trying not to break the roots or the stem. And when you're planting, continue that careful hand as you coax them into the pre-started holes in your seedling trays or pots. Cover them up with a clear dome to keep the conditions as stable as possible and watch for any signs of plants not making it. Within 24 hours, you'll know if the transplant was successful. Know what else is gonna be successful? Quite likely the next episode of the Garden Quickie. I love container gardening. Beyond the simplicity of planting in self-contained pots or grow bags, it really is an effective way to grow. Space Challenge gardeners know the benefits all too well. With the increased portability, accessibility, flexibility, as well as less weeding, less tools required, and more control over your soil. Container growing simplifies gardening down to its basics, and it's accessible for everyone. And speaking of basics, one of the fundamental ways to plant our veggie crops is to direct seed. Seeding the crop at the right time, growing its entire life cycle in one place. So what would happen if we were to combine the forces of container gardening and direct seeding? Interesting, right? Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome back to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we explore all the different ways to garden. And today is all about direct seeding in containers. I've got four crops that are absolute perfect candidates, so let's dive in. Direct seeded crops require much less labor, cost less, mature faster, and tend to be hard to transplant anyway. That definitely describes our first candidate, and that's carrots. Tiny little seeds sown by the thousands. Carrots make an excellent container direct seeder. As always, thinning may be required a few weeks after germination, which makes their care nearly identical to field-grown carrots. Plant number two on our list is beets. Just like carrots, beets are an amazing container crop, thriving in the cushy confines or a pot or fabric bag. All varieties are in play here, and as an added bonus, the tops are edible as well. Next, we have peas. Now, they're not heavily seeded like beets or carrots, but peas thrive on being direct seeded into pots. Germinating in less than a week, once you figure out how to support the foliage, your only issue is going to be how you're going to eat all that bountiful harvest. Lastly, we have a group of plants. That's right, herbs. All your lush favorites like arugula, basil, cilantro, chives, dill, and even green onions. These guys are built for containers. And if you wait until the weather is warm enough, direct seeding is a breeze. Know what else is a breeze? Watch in the next episode of The Garden Quickie. The annual tradition of starting your seeds early indoors. Getting a jump on that season and giving yourself the maximum growing window for success. It's truly amazing each and every time that new life springs up from what appears to be nothing. 
Little tiny seeds, planted with care, sprouting right on cue, timed perfectly in relation to your last spring frost date. Or maybe not. No doubt you're starting to see the bazillions of seed starting videos creeping into our feeds. Racks and racks of seeds at retail that have suddenly popped up. And maybe you started to get anxious a wee bit too early. Yep, guilty. Almost every year. And we all do it because we're gardeners. So what can we do if we started our seeds a little bit too early? And they look like this. And outdoors looks like that. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we fix all the gardening mistakes. And today is all about sowing our seeds too early. I got four ways to mitigate this potential timing disaster without having to restart all your seeds. Time short, so let's dive in. So you started your seeds a little bit early. What's the problem? The problem is that they're becoming too big, too lush, and too unruly for their comfy confines. One easy way to solve that is to simply move them onto bigger digs. Take your plugs and move them onto four inch pots. Or take your small pots and move them onto bigger ones. It's one more step, no question, but it sure beats having to start all over. Moving your plants along is great. It's the ideal scenario. Why would we stop a good thing? The only issue, and it's a big one, is space. This is 100 plugs, 100 little seedlings. And this is 18 of those plugs planted up into the exact same square area. After potting up even just one plug tray, most of us are going to be out of space. So we need to hold the plants back. And the first way to do this is temperature. Seeds love to sprout at 85 degrees Fahrenheit. But once they're up, once they're growing, you can take that temperature down to the mid 60s. In some cases, this is enough to completely stall the plants for the short term. And another way is to jack up the light. Indoor plants crave light, and they notoriously get long and leggy as they go searching for it. Bring the light closer to your plants, up the intensity, and the day length. And the final way that I slow down my indoor plants that are growing a bit too big is wind. Expose those lush soft leaves to periodic air circulation and toughen them up. Couple hours a day is all you need to have the desired effect. Know what else is all you need? Hopefully the next episode of the Garden Quickie. You've seen this stuff everywhere. In the garden centers, in the hardware stores, and in any potting mix you've ever bought. Perlite. Little snow white flecks of nothing, almost styrofoam like in nature. What is so special about this unassuming little white mineral? Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we tackle all your gardening questions. And today, is all about perlite. Perlite is actually non-crystalline volcanic glass. As such, whenever you're working with it directly, always wear a mask. Yes, perlite is a naturally occurring mineral, but the finished product that we use is altered in its form by superheating to nearly a thousand degrees Celsius. Be safe, wear a mask. So what do we do with this stuff? Well, perlite has three main uses in our soil. One, it improves aeration. By adding lightweight mass to the soil profile, perlite creates the much needed air gaps for our plants' roots to get the oxygen they need. Plus, even the perlite itself has little air gaps. Two, Perlite greatly improves drainage. Now, all plants love water. Terrestrial plants, however, do not like to stand in water. Our crops want the soil to be moist, but not saturated. Perlite increases the drainage ability of any soil. And this is going to allow the air and moisture to live in this ideal balance with the roots of our plants. And finally, perlite prevents soil compaction. 
Compacted soils are no good for plants due to poor aeration and poor drainage. The very same two things that we just said it helps with. But it gets even better. Perlite goes a step further by providing this structure to heavy soils, allowing both the air and the water to flow freely. Although non-toxic and naturally occurring, perlite is considered to be a non-renewable resource. So try not to use it indiscriminately. Know what you can use indiscriminately though? The next episode of the Garden Quickie. Vermiculite, perlite's dirty cousin. With the fears of asbestos behind it though, vermiculite is a powerhouse in the horticultural and plant worlds. Cheap and readily available make vermiculite very tempting and easy to use, but does that mean we should? Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we tackle all your gardening questions. And today's episode is all about vermiculite. Other than their rhyming names, perlite and vermiculite are two fairly unrelated soil additives. While perlite is expanded volcanic glass, Vermiculite is an exfoliated silicate, a type of clay material. And as such, it kind of does the opposite of what perlite does in our soils. While perlite is all about drainage and aeration, vermiculite is all about moisture and nutrient retention. I got three main benefits of using vermiculite in our soils. Time short, so let's dive in. Now, Saying that vermiculite doesn't help with drainage like perlite does isn't entirely true. Like perlite, it does bulk up heavy soils, creating more air gaps and pathways for that water to drain. It's the super light structure of these guys that really helps with clumpy heavy type soils, no question. But vermiculite also tackles those aeration and drainage problems in a different, more indirect approach. As a highly absorptive material, excess water can be stored within the vermiculite in your soils. By taking up excess water, this allows the air gaps to remain air gaps and prevents anaerobic conditions from forming. So, not as efficient at drainage as perlite is, but it can store excess water having the same net result, sort of. And because vermiculite takes it a step further and holds onto that moisture, as well as nutrients, this brings us to our third benefit for our soils. Vermiculite allows the plants to have access to both water and nutrients when they need them. So instead of shedding water and nutrients completely, they're locked up, waiting to be used by the plants. Next level stuff. Know what else should be next level? The next episode of the Garden Quickie. I love garlic. I love to grow it, and I love to eat it. The bulbs, the scapes, and the shoots. It elevates any meal. It's a long crop to grow, upwards of 8 to 10 months. So with that kind of time and space investment when you're planting garlic, you definitely don't want to mess around. Shockingly, one mistake that I've seen new garlic growers make is planting the whole bulb, intact. That's right, all those cloves jam-packed in there tightly, all together. I don't really know why for sure, but I suspect it's because they see those popular videos, you know, of the whole garlic bulb sprouting in just water, and they think that's how garlic is planted. While mainly just for show, growing garlic like this has little benefit. You can harvest some greens for sure, but no bulbs will ever be produced. Just for fun, a year ago I planted a few whole bulbs to show exactly this. I wonder what they're up to. Hi. I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of the Garlic Quickie. The show where in two minutes or less, we answer all the gardening questions. And today's episode is all about garlic. Or more accurately, how not to plant garlic. For those that don't know, here's a 20 second recap on how garlic is normally planted. In the fall, about a month before that first frost date, Individual garlic cloves are planted four inches apart, roughly two inches deep. They're then covered with a thick layer of mulch, usually straw, and left to overwinter in the ground. Green shoots form, and the garlic is off to the races. Early the following summer, 
the garlic bulbs are harvested and dried. Easy stuff, right? So what happens when you plant an entire bulb? Well, it's just as you would think. What do plants do when their spacing requirements are not met? They grow small, stunted, and they often don't make it to harvest. Same with our garlic here. Sure, the greens could have been harvested, but what a waste compared to the crop's true potential when it's planted properly. Sprouting whole garlic bulbs in water is a fun experiment, but its fruitfulness leaves a lot to be desired. Know what is fruitful though? Probably the next episode of the Garden Quickie. Like many of you guys, seed starting is my favorite time of the year. Well, other than harvesting time, of course. But the fresh seeding of new trays after the long, hard winter is so anticipatory and much needed. There's a lot riding on it too. What we plant and sprout now is the foundation of the bounty to come later. And there's nothing more foundational than what we plant the seeds in. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of the Garden Quickie. Episode 50, in fact. Wow. Truly amazing. Much love for all the support that you guys have given this little show. And speaking of love, there's nothing more that your seeds love than the right soil mixture. Today we're going to make our own with just three ingredients. It's a cinch to make. It'll save you tons of money. And it's usually a superior product. That's what we Canucks call a hat trick. Time sticking, so let's get into it. As many of you already know, seed starting mixes differ slightly from regular potting mixes. They're generally lighter, finer, free of course debris, and lower in nutrients. The real key with a good seed starting mix is that once it's set up, you want it to be this perfect stasis of moisture and air. To begin with, the only thing seeds need to germinate is water. That's it. But the light structure of a good seed starting mix is going to facilitate that rapid creation of that root network shortly after germination. You see, good seed starting is not just about the initial sprouting. Okay, so how do we make the mix? Start off with 50% age compost. Now, I generally go with store-bought for my seeding mixes as it tends to be more sterile than my backyard compost. Next, match that with another 50% coconut fiber. Mine comes in these compressed bricks, so I just activate it with hot water first. On its own, with just these two ingredients, this is a perfectly sufficient seeding mix. But if you can swing it, Adding in about 10 to 15% perlite will really make this mix sing. The benefits of that added aeration that the perlite gives cannot be overstated, both for germination and the early growth of the seedlings. You know what else cannot be overstated? How excited I am for the next 50 episodes of the Garden Quickie. Thanks for watching, guys. And hey, if Garden Quickies are your thing, be sure to click on this playlist here as we explore and solve more growing issues in two minutes or less.